The words we use to talk about a topic strongly influence how we percept it. This might seem like an obvious statement, but when we look at the news and what's happening in the last years, this is something which is so true. We just think about, seriously, a matter bottle? <laughs> so this is something we see come true. Words have a lot of meaning. When you think of Trump, what's happening there, it has a lot to do with speech. Lisa is a linguistic student, and she will talk to us exactly about this topic. She will tell us how words can be used to shape our perception of a certain topic. In this case, the Snoopers Charter of the UK, a charter which forces ISP to save your browser history. This is scary. So please, welcome Lisa with a big round of applause. Thank you. Okay, so let's begin. Um, hey, I'm Lisa and I'm a linguist. Welcome to my talk. This is not a proposal about mass surveillance, analyzing the terminology of the UK Snoopers Charter. So many people interested in linguistics so late in the day. This is amazing. Thank you very much for attending my talk. Um, I hope all of you had a wonderful congress so far. Are there any linguists in the audience? One. And maybe some more, yeah, in the back. Nice, very nice. Okay, um, let's begin. Um, in this talk, I'm going to take a closer look at the Snoopers Charter and its terminology from a corpus linguistic point of view. So, what is the Investigatory Powers Act, also known as Snoopers Charter? Um, it is a new legislation which extends the surveillance powers of the state, and it would allow the security agencies to keep so-called internet connection records for up to one year, and to hack mobile phones and laptops on a large scale without any suspicion. It was previously known as the Investigatory Powers Bill. And to make it a bit clearer, a bill is a law which has only been proposed but has not passed um, both houses of parliament. The Investigatory Powers Bill has received royal assent and was made into an act in November 2016. It was nicknamed Snoopers Charter due to the extensive surveillance. To give a bit of history, the term Snoopers Charter has been around for a while and it is not new at all. It was used for the communications data bill, previously a previous surveillance bill. And a newspaper article refers to this bill as the most draconian piece of surveillance legislation ever proposed in a democracy. Wow. So. This bill was blocked in 2013, but a new bill, as we can see, is on the way. So, um, now I'm going to talk briefly about the methods I used to give you uh, an impression of what I was doing. Um, as I want to find out how certain expressions are used in the parliamentary debates and in the media coverage, um, my focus will be on the context of certain words and words, as you know, do not stand on its own, but always have a context around it to explain the meaning and to give an impression of what the word is actually about. Okay, so I'm going to make use of methods of corpus linguistics. What is corpus linguistics? Uh, corpus linguistics is the study of language based on examples of real life language use. What is real life language? Well, newspaper articles, leaflets, student essays, transcripts of spoken data, and so on. A corpus is a collection of machine-readable texts, 
and corpora can come in various sizes, ranging from several thousand to millions or even billions of words. To give an example, Wikipedia, everybody knows it, can also be regarded as a corpus and contains around 1.9 billion words. So it's really a large corpus. Whereas the British National Corpus is a bit smaller and contains around 100 million words. So, why is corpus linguistics useful? Well, it allows you to work with large amounts of data. And linguistics examinations are then carried out using software, for example, and Kong, in my case. And it allows you to work with amounts of data you would, which would take years to analyze by hand, and you can just do it with a click a lot easier. Um, yeah. Why is it also useful? Well, it helps to reduce researcher bias. That means that there's a tendency that researchers tend to pay more attention to things they encounter at an earlier stage of research than at a later stage. And if you're working with millions of words, it's a lot harder to be biased about your results compared to if you only worked with, let's say, two or three newspaper articles, which you had to analyze by hand. Okay, so. okay in this analysis, I used two methods of corpus linguistics, concordance analysis and collocation analysis. Both methods are very useful to examine the context of keywords in the corpus. Okay, concordance analysis gives you several words around the keyword you were searching for. And the span of words can be adjusted and usually it's around five words to either side of the keyword. So this is a screenshot from the corpus analysis program I used. In the middle, in blue script, you can see bulk data. This is my keyword, which I entered at the very bottom, if you can see. And Ankong allows you to analyze three levels. There is, in this case, one word to the left of the keyword, is the red section. And the second and the third word to the right of the keyword. You can see in green, and in purple, and in this version it's sorted alphabetically. Then you can scroll down and have a look at the, all the concordances and all the contexts around bulk data. Mm -hmm. yes. The second method I used is called collocation analysis, and this method is very useful to examine the connotations and associations between words. The relation to other words is crucial for understanding the meaning of a word. We already had that. And the collocation is defined as the above frequent co-occurrence of two words within a predetermined span. Once again, it's usually around five words to either side of the search term, because if you make the span larger, you might have two or three, diff two or three sentences which are not even related to your keyword anymore. And to give an example, the two strongest collocations in the British National Corpus for juice are orange and lemon. So, okay. And in order to indicate the strength of a collocation, mutual information is used. It's calculated based on the expected probability of two words appearing near each other their relative frequencies, and the overall size of a corpus. Then, you compare the expected probability and the observed probability, and this difference is translated into a number. And the higher the number, the stronger the collocation. But if you use a corpus analysis program, all this is done for you. So, here's a screenshot and you can see the collocations of surveillance. And this is quite unusual that so many words have the same value, same MI value. You can see it in the section with stat statistics. Yeah. Okay. 
and usually articles, prepositions, etc., are not taken into consideration because their frequency is evenly distributed across the corpus. Okay. So, in my analysis, I used two corpora the investigatory power side corpus and the news on the web corpus. So the Investigatory Powers Act corpus was compiled by searching for the expression Investigatory Powers Bill on Hansard, the official documentation of parliamentary debates. And my corpus consists of 63 debates, some written statements, and the final legal text of the Investigatory Powers Act. In total, it has a size of 1,060,219 words. So it's a relative small corpus, but still it's, li it's large enough to show some patterns, and it's not too small to not be able to do an analysis. The second corpus is an online corpus called News on the Web and it consists of newspaper articles from the English-speaking world. And it was started in 2010, and it is updated every 24 hours. So it is the most recent corpus you can find because it covers all the articles until yesterday. And in order to be able to compare the two corpora, I restricted the time span of the searches to the time span of the parliamentary debate that is from July 2014 until November 2016. All in all, in this time span, I was interested in the corpus had 4,350,000,000 words. So it is roughly 4,000 times larger than the Investigatory Powers Act corpus. So, with such a vast amount of data, you, of course, can do a lot of different analysis. And in this talk, I will pick out three keywords. And this is going to be the term Snoopers Charter, mass surveillance, everyone's favorite word, and bulk data. OK, let's begin. So in order to find out what to snoop means, I consulted the dictionary. And in the Oxford English Dictionary, to snoop is defined as to pry into matters one need not be concerned with. Keep that in mind for a bit, please. So let's have a look at the concordances. Usually, if, as you've seen on the screenshot, you have 50 or even 100 concordances. But in this talk, I will only give you a, a small excerpt. So. In my view, it will knock out completely the lazy label of Snoopers Charter. I was not going to use the phrase Snoopers Charter because it is counterproductive, nor was I going to use the phrase mass surveillance. I was about to attack him for the phrase Snoopers Charter, but he managed to get out in time. I also hope that the politically loaded and seriously misleading phrase Snoopers Charter has been removed from our lexicon. Snooping, hence the populist phrase Snoopers Charter. So, what is striking about the expression Snoopers Charter is that it's either accompanied by a direct, a form of direct negation or another form of denunciation or disapproval, such as lazy label misleading phrase, populist phrase, conspiracy theories, and so on and so forth. And all this aims at invalidating criticism of the bill. In addition, it conveys the message that everybody who refers to the bill as a snoopers charter is neither trustworthy nor informed nor appreciates the work of security agencies. And here I have a wonderful quote for you. In my view, it is lazy to label the bill a Snoopers Charter or a plan for mass surveillance. In fact, it is worse than lazy. It is insulting to people who work at the police and in the security services. So, linking the bill and the term to Snoop is highly undesired. Remember the definition. 
It implies that the government oversteps its bounds and that the bill legalizes activities which are otherwise unacceptable. So, the strongest color codes of Snoopers Charter are label, phrase and called. And all this suggests that a Snoopers Charter and the genuine nature of the bill are two entirely different things. So, Snoopers Charter is nothing but a hollow phrase and it lacks an element it signifies. Okay. So, let's have a look at how Snoopers Charter is used in the newspaper corpus. Reintroduce a beefed up version of the Snoopers Charter. The Snoopers Charter is discredited, unlawful, and treats us all as suspects. Saying that the bill is neither a Snoopers Charter nor a plan for mass surveillance. Renewed effort to pass a Snoopers Charter bill of increased surveillance powers. The Home Secretary will try to sweeten her pill of her revived Snoopers Charter. Okay, so roughly one third of the concordances mention that the Investigatory Powers Bill is named the Snoopers Charter. And more than one third mentions the existence of a previous Snoopers Charter, the Communications Data Bill. And to be honest, this is how I knew about this Communications Data Bill because I did some research only due to reading about it on the newspaper, not by doing research on the Parliamentary Debates Corpus. So, this is why newspapers report about renewed effort to reintroduce a beefed up version of the Snoopers Charter. So, as a consequence, the negative overtone of the previous communications data bill is transferred to the current bill. In addition, it is pointed out that the bill is made to seem less unpleasant than it actually is. The Home Secretary will try to sweeten the pill of her revived Snoopers Charter. So, Snoopers Charter rarely occurs with a negation in the newspaper articles, and if it does occur with a neg negation, it is a quote from the parliamentary debate. And the strongest collocates of Snoopers Charter are so called and, and dubbed. Okay, so. Mm. What can we learn from the concordances about this expression? So, in the Investigatory Powers Act corpus, 75% of the occurrences are negated or contain some form of disapproval or denunciation. Whereas in the now corpus, the term is hardly negated. The Investigatory Powers Bill entirely lacks reference to a previous Snoopers Charter but in the newspaper corpus, many references are given to the previous Snoopers Charter. In the parliamentary debates, criticism is used to refer to people using the term, whereas in the newspaper corpus, criticism is directed at the implications of the bill. So, all in all, the term Snoopers Charter is burdened with negative associations from the previous communications data bill and as a consequence it is strictly avoided in the parliamentary debates and if it is used at all it is negated. Okay, so the second term I had a look at is um, mass surveillance. It is not important, is it not important for us to continue to reassure the public that this is not a proposal for mass surveillance and to restate the essential need for the bill. Um, not except that the bill is a plan for mass surveillance, neither a Snoopers Charter nor a plan for mass surveillance, a Snoopers Charter or a plan for mass surveillance, neither a Snoopers Charter nor a plan for mass surveillance. So altogether, the term mass surveillance does not appear very often throughout the entire corpus about 28 times per million words, that is not a lot. And in over 50% of these occurrences, a form of negation appears. 
um, several instances mention Snoopers Charter and mass surveillance in one negated sentence in order to suggest that both terms are equally inadequate to describe the investigatory powers bill. Strongest collocates of mass surveillance are plan, charger, and of course, not. Okay. So, and here's some excerpts from the news on the web corpus. Um, open court hearing into whether GCHQ's alleged mass surveillance of private communication breaks human rights laws. Major US technology companies suffering from the fallout of the NSA's mass surveillance programs. Under criticism for its mass surveillance practices. Reports about the NSA's mass surveillance programs carrying out mass surveillance as their critics have claimed. So the concordances reveal a strong negative connotation of mass surveillance. It ranges from breaking human right laws to even the nuclear fallout. And by drawing these comparisons, it is implied that the consequences are harmful, long lasting and not easily to overcome. So mass surveillance is dangerous. This is a message. Um, this was only an excerpt, but other concordances mention mass surveillance in the same breath as war crimes and totalitarian institutions such as the Nazis and the East German secret police. Some articles refer directly to mass surveillance as bulk collection, and I give you a quote, weaseling their way out by calling mass surveillance terms like bulk collection. Very few instances bring up mass surveillance in a negated sentence, and most of these instances are quotes from politicians or even from the debates regarding the investigatory powers bill. The strongest collocates of mass surveillance are tempora, GCSB, which, is, which stands for New Zealand's Government Communication Security Bureau, and GCHQ. So. Mass surveillance is inevitably linked to modern governments and the surveillance programs. And if you omit acronyms, because they do not really count as lexical words, um, the most, the strongest collocates are revelations, indiscriminate and interception. So, what can we learn from the concordances? Well, in the parliamentary debates, in over 50% of the occurrences, mass surveillance is negated, and now it is hardly negated. And the now corpus also reveals the full extent of mass surveillance and its negative connotations. Okay. So the last term I'm going to have a look at is bulk data. And once again, I consulted the dictionary to find out more about this word. So, in the Oxford English Dictionary, bulk is defined as a great or considerable volume, a mass, the collective mass of any object. It's usually used in the context of cargo and commerce, in bulk, lying loose in heaps, without a package, and so on. So, let's have a look at the concordances. The ability to acquire bulk data is necessary. The ability to collect bulk data is essential. The bill supervises entirely the ability to collect bulk data. Despite his attempts to conceal his activities, the agencies were able to use bulk data to identify that he had recently traveled to a European country. It empowers our services to access and analyze bulk data, a tool that has become more important than ever before. So the context of bulk data can be split up into three major sections. The majority of the concordances, as we've seen in this, in this excerpt, stresses the necessity and proportionality of bulk data. A common strategy is to list incidents of when and how bulk data proved useful. 16% refer to bulk data in a rather neutral contract text. That means stating amendments which refer to bulk data. And only 12% mention bulk data in a critical context and exemplify this really abstract term 
and its indiscriminate approach by referring to a mess of combined harvester. <laughs> so, but of course, such using such vivid imagery is uh, undesired. So let's have a look at the following quote. I appreciate that bulk powers are controversial, but I am absolutely sure that we do not conduct mass that we do not conduct data harvesting in this country. It simply does not happen. The use of bulk powers is not for that purpose, but for the purpose of examining material. Even though that may be done in bulk, it is done in a way that does not amount to the generalized harvesting of data for the examination. It simply is not, says Mr. Grief. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, the speaker does not clearly define what distinguishes data harvesting from the use of bulk powers for the purpose of examining material in bulk. So, everybody knows this man? And he talks about double thing in the following way. The power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them. So what, what does this tell us? This unshakable faith in the good intentions of mass surveillance makes people actually believe that measures which correspond to the definition of mass surveillance are actually not mass surveillance. Mm -hmm. So, maybe there are other things to worry about than Russian bots. I don't know. Um, there's a general tendency of redefining mass surveillance as bulk data collection. And this aims at redirecting atten attention from mass to data, which means, in other words, it directs attention from a term which denotes a large group of people or items to a term which denotes something very abstract and depersonalized. So, replacing surveillance with collection further disguises the ongoing process. Collect is a very neutral and fuzzy term, just think about people collecting stamps or coins or stuff like this. Whereas surveillance is very straightforward and unambiguous. Bulk or in bulk, maybe you remember the definition, is usually used to denote merchandise, and this linking further emphasizes the depersonalization. It is constantly stressed in the Investigatory Powers Act that mass surveillance and bulk data collection are not to be equated. Collection of bulk data, most of which are never even read, does not constitute mass surveillance. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, we cannot um, grasp from the debates what constitutes mass surveillance if not the collection of communication data in bulk. And this also, you know, throughout the entire corpus, there's a prevalence to refer to the Investigatory Powers Bill and its measures in terms of what they not are, than, rather than saying what they actually are. So, um, the strongest collocates of bulk data are harvesting, analyze, and collection. So, now, have a look at the concordances in news on the web. A year ago, a presidential advisory board on privacy concluded that the bulk data collection was illegal and unproductive. And businesses already face bulk data collection of a different kind, as demonstrated by the hack and theft of millions of TalkTalk customers. If you are looking for a clear and comprehensive guide to how communications have been intercepted, from cable cutting in the First World War to bulk data collection exposed by Ed Snowden, this is it. Have used recent attacks to argue for broader surveillance and bulk data gathering. Bulk data collection, neither lawful nor effective. So as you can see, the context of bulk data in the news on the web corpus is very diverse. The majority of concordances refers to the Snowden disclosures or the USA Freedom Act. Some articles express a very critical attitude. 
and actually equate bulk data with mass surveillance. Here's a quote. Bulk data retention, what anyone else would call mass surveillance. Bulk data collection is referred to as neither lawful nor effective, also seen up from the excerpts. Several articles highlight the utility of bulk data. Here's a quote. A GCHQ analyst trawling bulk data spotted suspicious activity, which turned out to be a Syrian jihadi. Uh -huh. So, only a very small number, two out of 100 concordances of the articles, refer directly to the investigatory powers bill, and this actually surprised me. The strongest collocates were GCHQ and NSA, and once again, this indicates that bulk data is linked to modern governments, similarly as mass surveillance. So, disregarding acronyms, bulk data most strongly collocated with interception, collection, and interference. So, so. okay. In the Investigatory Powers Act, the majority of concordances highlighted the importance and necessity of bulk data, whereas in the newspaper corpus, the majority of concordances refer to the Snowden revelations or the USA Freedom Act. And in the parliamentary debates, we have this tendency of redefining mass surveillance as bulk data or bulk data collection. Okay, so to give a short summary, Snoopers Charter and mass surveillance were the two keywords which were used most diversely, and they were used in two completely different ways in the two corpora. Snoopers Charter and mass surveillance were also the two least frequent keywords in the investigatory powers bill, and the two most frequent keywords in the news on the web corpus. So, as I pointed out before, there's a general prevalence to refer to the Investigatory Powers Act and its measures in terms of what they not are. And as a consequence, the debates are no longer concerned with the nature of these things because things are only defined ex negativo. So, and in the Investigatory Powers Act, you have a strong tendency for rather non-descriptive terms. But in the news and the web corpus, there is a stronger prevalence for negatively connoted words such as mass surveillance. And this might be rooted in the nature of the two spheres. I had a look at um, a newspaper has an interest in translating legal language into language its readers understand, whereas political language is often designed to disguise unpleasant facts. So, last but not least, um, I did a lot of reading while I was compiling this analysis and did a lot of reading through all sorts of debates and I compiled a top three of my favorite quotes from these debates, one you already know. So, I sincerely hope that as the bill proceeds, we have a way to go yet. We will explain that we do not conduct mass surveillance in the UK. Indeed, it is not done in the USA. Collection of bulk data, most of which I never even read, does not constitute mass surveillance. And, oh, yeah. and second one, <laughs> however uneasy we may feel about internet connection records or thematic warrants, that does not compare to the infinitely greater unease we ought to feel about our intelligence agencies being unable to use those tools to keep us safe. <laughs> and once again, Mr. Orwell, the power of holding two contradictory beliefs in one's mind simultaneously and accepting both of them, to tell deliberate lies while genuinely believing in them, to forget any fact that has become inconvenient and then, when it becomes necessary again, to draw it back from oblivion for just as long as it is needed 
to deny the existence of objective reality and all the while to take account of the reality which one denies, all this is indispensably necessary. And <laughs> I appreciate that bug powers are controversial, but I'm absolutely sure that we do not conduct data harvesting in this country. It simply does not happen. The use of bug powers is not for that purpose, but for the purpose of examining material. Even though that may be done in bulk, it is done in a way that does not amount to the generalized harvesting of data for the examination. It simply is not. Okay, so a few words on the bibliography. If you're really interested in corpus linguistics, I would recommend Mr. Paul Baker and pretty much everything he has written. And if you want to play around with the corpus, is you can find it online under now corpus. Okay. So. Okay. Any questions? So, if you have a question, please come to the microphones. And I will tell you who's first. And so we start with microphone number one. Thank you for the interesting talk. Uh, did you observe a change in time of the usage of, of words? So this is basically a histogram of the, of the usage, but uh, something like the time series analysis. So we had in Germany uh, the wording Vorratsdatenspeicherung to save something for later, yeah. which is, has a positive connotation connotation, but in the, in, in the discussion it came that everybody knew Vorratsdatenspeicherung is, is bad and now, then they changed the wording. Mm -hmm. uh, did so this you, happen in, in this discussion? Uh, from what I know, the terminology has not changed. So I did not take a closer look at this first Snoopers Charter because um, the second Snoopers Charter, the one I was talking about, is a milder version of the first Snoopers Charter, but from what I know, the terminology has not changed. It was always called bulk data, bulk data collection, bulk data interception, stuff like this. Thank you. Okay, question here, number three. When you searched in the law, in the laws, you searched for the term Investigatory Powers Act. Um, but when you search in the online newspaper, you search for Snoopers Charter. Might um, that have introduced some kind of bias? The thing is, if you if you consult this um, answer, this documentation of parliamentary debates, um, the debates are only found if you enter the official term. Yeah. But the thing is that you. Um, if you look for newspaper articles, sorry, can you ask a question again? So, basically, have you considered searching for Investigatory Powers Act in the newspapers as well to see whether um, the, these articles maybe have a different language about it than the articles containing Snoopers Charter, which is a loaded term, I guess? Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't do that. Okay, number one. Um, yeah, so I campaigned against the Investigative Powers Act as part as a member of Open Rights Group, and I was just wondering how, when we had the press very much on our side, how you recommend that we can actually improve, like, because we lost that one. <laughs> Is that too quick? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yes, yeah, so I campaigned with Open Rights Group against the Snoopers Charter, and we mostly had the press on our side, mm -hmm. but we still lost. Um, and I just wondered if you had any advice for how we could do better. Mm, that's a very tricky question. I found many articles saying that many UK citizens don't even know what the Snoopers Charter is. And I think a lot was done to, I mean, these, these debates have been, have been going on for almost two years. I think a lot has been done to um, disguise the ongoing process of what is actually being discussed. But I, I, 
yeah, analyzing something afterwards is not the same as suggestion how to do it better. But um, yeah, it's a nice idea to, to perhaps use this as a basis for next time to make an analysis this way. Um, so, we come to you later. We have also a question from the signal angel, so from the internet. Yes, we do. Um, what were the tool did you, uh, what tool did you use for the collection and analysis, and are they available? Um, for the corpus, I compiled myself. I used an uh, open source tool called AntConc, A-N-T-C-O-N-C. And if you search for it, you can find it and download it. And the web-based corpus comes with a built-in tool. You just enter the search term, you're interested in it on the website, and it has its own analysis tool. But there are all sorts of concordance programs. I think the most known one is called Wordsmith, but um, it's not free, from what I know. Okay. Okay, microphone number one. Thank you for your brilliant analysis, Lisa. Um, my first part of the question would have been similar to the last one. So what narratives can we maybe use to hack the discourse on such surveillance uh, questions? But um, yeah, um, and the second part of my question um, is maybe a kind of uh, another term that is maybe interesting in this discourse, uh, security, because security most often is used in a way that it, uh, it like, there is a ter terrorist attack, so we need more security, so we need more surveillance. Yeah. But it can also be used in a way of um, this, the, uh, the Investigatory Powers Act uh, introduces res restrictions on encryption, um, which weakens IT security and our all collective security in the internet. So, um, yeah, maybe I would be interested in the uses of security in this particular, um, in this particular discourse. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, well, as I said before, if you have such a large corpus, you can run endless analysis. Uh, I thought about doing security. One thing that is always, as I say, um, it was not as striking because it is used over and over again. And I wanted to pick out a more specific term. But you could, I mean, you could focus on verbs, how are they used, you could focus on adjectives. You could, I mean, if you're, if you're into it, you can just search for it online and, and, and do your own analysis and just have a look. I mean, if, even if you have a look at a couple of concordances, you quite quickly get an idea of how this word is used. And so, yeah. cool. Okay, so that's it for tonight, or for this talk. I think there's another one afterwards. So please, let's thank Lisa again for this amazing talk and the nice Q&A. A big round of applause. Thank you very much.